All of the lessons this past week have been from the book of Daniel. We learned from our studies that Daniel and his friends were taken into the Babylonian captivity. This is found in Daniel chapter 1. We believe at the time Daniel was taken into captivity, he was a young man, maybe around 16 years old. When we come to Daniel chapter 9, Daniel has, for the most part, lived his life. He's likely in his 80s at this point. When he was taken into captivity, Babylon was a world-ruling empire. King Nebuchadnezzar came with his forces and destroyed the city of Jerusalem. He began that project in 606 B.C., came back again in 597, and finally destroyed the city in 586 and took many into captivity. Daniel has been in captivity all this time, but there's been a change. The Babylonians have now been overcome by the Medo-Persian kingdom. So when you come to Daniel chapter 9 in the opening line, you read of a man named Darius. Darius is a Persian king. And that, again, because the Persians conquered the Babylonians. Daniel was a prominent man, however, not only in the Babylonian kingdom, but also in the Medo-Persian kingdom. And there's one thing that is certainly true about Daniel, something that stands out whether we're reading about his time in the Babylonian Empire or in the Medo-Persian Empire, and that is that Daniel was faithful. All the way through, Daniel was faithful, and he was a man of prayer. In Daniel chapter 9, we have a wonderful prayer that Daniel prays on behalf of God's people. It is a prayer of repentance and confession. Daniel is praying, interceding for God's people because they had sinned against God. And Daniel is reflecting on the transgressions of the past. And he is petitioning God for the sins of God's people. That is the setting and context of what we're about to read. We'll not take the time to read the entire prayer at this time. Let's read the first 10 verses together that we might get an understanding of the nature of this prayer. Daniel 9, beginning in verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made confession, made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. 
Daniel is saying, in effect, God, we had ample warning. Your prophets came and warned us, and we would not hearken to them. And now we are suffering the consequences of our transgression, and we plead with you to forgive our sins. I want to speak for a few moments this morning regarding Daniel's prayer and some lessons we learned that will help us in our prayer lives today. Pray without ceasing, so says 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, Luke 18, 1. Prayer should be an integral part of your life and mine. And there are many principles and lessons we learn from this great prayer. And I hope that this will be beneficial to all of us. Daniel's prayer. Notice in the first place, we learn from Daniel's prayer that his prayer was based upon his knowledge of God's will. His prayer was based upon his knowledge of God's will. Take a look at verse 2 again. In the first year of his reign, that is the reign of Darius, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years. He means the numbers of the year, years of the captivity, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is the only prophet who specified the length of time God's people would be in the captivity. Jeremiah chapter 25 as well as Jeremiah chapter 29. I want to read from Jeremiah chapter 29. And notice the details that Jeremiah predicts as he is predicting the time, the duration of the Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah 29, beginning at verse 10, For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, and perform my good word toward you, in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me, and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into this place whence I caused you to be carried away captive." Did you notice from this reading in verse 12 of Jeremiah 29, God says, When you call upon me, when you pray unto me, then I will hearken. And I will bring you forth from captivity and I'll bring you back to this place. Now, Daniel is doing that very thing. Looking back to the books, he said, that he learned from the books he means he learned from Jeremiah's writings. He learned this time would be 70 years. And he prays to God that God would restore, that God would forgive. Daniel's knowledge of God's word did not make prayer unnecessary. Someone might reason, well, if he read that God's people would be brought back to their homeland, then why pray at all? He read in the books that the time would be 70 years. Why even pray? Just because we know a thing from God's word doesn't mean that we sh should not pray concerning that thing. In fact, the Bible clearly teaches that God knows our needs before we ask him. Matthew 6, verse 8, Your heavenly Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Well, why ask at all? Here's why. Because God wants us to depend on him. God wants us to see that we stand in need of his mercy, grace, his forgiveness, his guidance. And so he wants us to pray to him and express that dependence. The more we know about God's will, the more effective our prayers will be. And why would I say that? Well, it has to do with the statement that Kevin read in our hearing a moment ago from 1 John chapter 5. 
Listen again to 1 John 5, beginning at verse 14. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Well, what if we ask things that are not in keeping with his will? Well, there's no reason for us to think that God would honor such a prayer if we ask things that are not in keeping with his will. If I were to pray today that God would bless me with a million dollars tomorrow, I don't think that's going to happen because I don't think that's God's will for my life. But if I were to pray that God would forgive me for some sin, if I had sin in my life, I could have great assurance that God would hear and honor that prayer. Well, why? Because the Bible teaches that God is willing to forgive our sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9. So that is a thing I know is in keeping with God's will. I know it is God's will that we as his children can pray for forgiveness and he will forgive. Just as Daniel knew that in captivity he could pray that God would restore and forgive his people. And Daniel knew that God would. But Daniel is expressing his confidence in God and his dependence upon God. And so we may not pray as often as we should because we lack faith in prayer. We lack faith that God will actually hear and honor our prayers. But the more we study God's word and the more we know God's written, revealed will, then the more effective our prayers should be as we pray for things that are in keeping with God's will. There are things, of course, regarding God's personal work in our lives through his providential hand. Maybe his will is unclear at times. But we trust that as we pray that God will guide us in the way we should go. He will direct our steps. Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. So Daniel's prayer was based upon his knowledge of God's will. But in the second place we learn from Daniel's prayer that Daniel was motivated by confidence in God's character. The thing that motivated Daniel to pray was not that Daniel was such a good man. It wasn't that he felt God's people were worthy. But Daniel had faith in God's character. Take a look at verses 3 and 4. Daniel says, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, Now notice, O Lord, the great and dreadful God. Daniel addresses God as the great and dreadful God. That's the King James translation. We typically do not use the term dreadful as it is used here. When we think of something dreadful, we might think of something that is awful or unpleasant. But dreadful here denotes the idea that God is awesome, that God is all-powerful, the great and the awesome, all-powerful God, keeping covenant God is one who keeps his promises. Daniel knew that God had promised that his people would be in captivity for 70 years and then would return home. And now Daniel is praying and he's trusting that God is one who keeps his word. And then he says, and mercy to them that love him. God is merciful. That is, he has compassion for us in our sin and in our fallen state. God has compassion on us when we stand in need of his forgiveness. God is compassionate. And then, and to them that keep his commandments. And so as we keep his commandments, God hears and honors our prayers. Take a look at verse 7. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces as at this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are afar off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass and 
they have trespassed against thee. You'll notice in the opening line of verse 7, righteousness belongs to God, not to Daniel and to the people of Israel. They stood in need of God's forgiveness. So Daniel is actually appealing to God on the basis of God's character. The reason that Daniel had any faith in prayer at all was because of God. God had promised that he would keep his covenant. Take a look at verses 17 through 19 of this great prayer. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, hearken and do, defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. Notice again in verse 18, it's not because of our righteousness, Daniel prays, but it is based upon your great mercy. Why should God hear your prayer today? When we stumble, as we often do, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth is not in us, 1 John 1, 8, and we pray to God for forgiveness, why should God forgive? Why should he listen to our prayers and honor our prayers? It certainly isn't because we are worthy or deserving. It's not because we are so good, but it is because he is good and he has promised that he will hear and that he will honor our prayers. No matter how miserably we may have failed, we should never be reluctant to pray to God and seek his forgiveness. Someone might think, well, I, I've stumbled in such a way that I can't even Lift up my face to God. I'm so ashamed of what I've done. But our forgiveness is not based upon how great we are or how worthy we might be. But it's based upon God's character, his righteousness, and his willingness to forgive our sins. Daniel was motivated to pray, not because God's people were worthy, but because God was righteous. And God had promised to hear and honor his, their prayers. But then we learn in the third place that prayer should be based upon humility. We see throughout this prayer that Daniel is humble before God as he prays. Notice again in verse 3, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. You're familiar with fasting in times of great distress, sadness. God's people would often uh, go through a period of fasting. They believed that this would help them to be more spiritually focused in some way. And then sackcloth, a rough type of cloth that was literally used to make sacks. And the Jews would wear during times of distress, during times of mourning, this sackcloth around their waist. And then ashes during periods of great distress. It was common for God's people to take ashes and throw up on their heads. Daniel, as he begins praying, he says, I began to seek God with supplications, fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed and I made my supplication. And as you read this prayer, he acknowledges the transgressions of God's people. He says that we haven't listened to the prophets. We, we turned a deaf ear to your prophets who came and warned us of our impending doom. The more we pray today, the more we should see our dependence upon God. And the more we should lose our sense of self-importance, the more we should lose our sense of self-righteousness and recognize 
that without God we are nothing. Jesus said, John chapter 15 and verse 5, without me you can do nothing. And so we need God's grace and His mercy. In Psalm 51, there's a, a great psalm, which, of course, was a song. The psalms were songs that God's people sang. And David wrote these words, we believe, in a time of contrition and repentance. In verse 17 of Psalm 51, the scripture says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. God is looking for people with a broken heart. People who recognize their need for God. Not one who believes that he's self-sufficient and doesn't need God. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a publican. And as these men began to pray, the Pharisee began to remind God of all the things that he had done. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And he looked down upon the lowly publican, this lowly outcast standing beside him. And he said, and not as this publican. I'm not like this fellow over here. I'm far superior to him. But you remember the publican he simply smote upon his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He felt so unworthy and inferior. And Jesus, in making his application of that parable, said, This man, not the Pharisee, not the self-righteous man who boasted and bragged about how great he was, but the lowly publican went down to his house justified, rather than the other. And Jesus went on to say, everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. That's a parable about humility. And when we pray, we should pray with humility. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he will lift you up, James 4 and verse 10. And then a final lesson from Daniel's prayer. We learn from Daniel's prayer that we have great assurance that God will indeed hear and honor our prayers. Take a look at verse 20. We didn't read the entire prayer. When you come to verse 20, we have the end of Daniel speaking in prayer. The Bible says, and whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. And then there is a vision of the 70 weeks. It's a difficult passage. But one thing we can agree upon is that the 70 weeks has to do with the coming Messiah and how that Jesus, the Messiah, would usher in salvation for God's people. He would come as the great Redeemer. God's answer was revealed by an angel. He's referred to as a man because he presents himself in the form of a man. His name is Gabriel. And Gabriel speaks to Daniel and he says, Your prayer has been heard. At the beginning of your supplication, the commandment came forth. And God has dispatched me to reveal to you the things that will come to pass. God heard Daniel's prayer. And God actually sent an angel to give him the assurance that his prayer was honored. 
There are angels at work in the spiritual realm. I don't know what all angels may do in the spiritual domain, but I do know the Bible says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to, to those who shall be heirs of salvation? Hebrews 1 verse 14. The idea is that they are ministering spirits. And that they are sent forth to minister to those who shall be heirs of salvation. That's you. We are heirs of salvation. God, when we pray, acts and works providentially in our lives. I don't know all the ways that God may work providentially. But I know he does. All things work together for good to them that love God. To those who are the called according to his purpose, Romans 8 and verse 28. We should never doubt God that he will answer and honor our prayers. I do not believe Gabriel is going to appear to me today. I do not believe that angels will appear to anyone today. But I do believe that God hears and honors our prayers the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James says that prayer, it actually avails. That is, it is effective, it helps, it works, it avails much. Let us not, therefore, be discouraged when we pray. We may not see immediate results. We may not see an immediate yes answer to our prayers. But we ought always to pray and not to faint. These are great lessons we learn from Daniel's prayer. Daniel's prayer was based upon his knowledge of God's will. And when we pray for things that are in keeping with God's will, the promise is that he hears us. Daniel's prayer was motivated by his confidence in God's character, not in Daniel's righteousness. And when we pray today, we can pray knowing that based upon who God is, because he is good, because he is righteous, he will honor his word and he will honor our prayers prayer should be offered in humility God doesn't owe us a thing but we owe him everything and so we should approach God's throne with humility and then having done these things we can know that when we pray there is the great assurance that God hears and honors our prayers we're going to sing a song of invitation if you've never obeyed the gospel you should do that while you have this time and opportunity. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. If you've never been, been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, we invite you to do that and do that while you have this time. If you need restoration, we're going to sing a song to encourage you. Whatever your need may be, we invite you to come now as together we stand and sing.